Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining today's Stay Connected webinar. On behalf of our Get Connected Conference Planning Committee and partners, uh, we welcome you and really appreciate this chance to stay connected to you all throughout the school year. We are really excited to um, learn about a brand new resource offered uh, for schools and after school programs um, on a really interesting topic. I'd say kind of fun and unique. So today we have Andrea Riley and Chris Cachette who are gonna tell a little bit about what they do and share some great information with you today. Thanks, Andrea. Thanks, Chris, for, for being here. Thanks for having us. Well, thank you. <laughs> I'll go ahead and start. Hi, I'm Andrea Riley, and I am a registered nurse. I'm with a children's school health team. Um, I serve as a school health liaison, and children's provides um, school health services for the Nebraska Department of Education. And I also serve as Nebraska's state school nurse consultant. So I work with school nurses from all across the state. Um, go ahead, Chris. And I, I get to work with all sorts of awesome state partners, such as Chris Cashat here. <laughs> So I am Chris Kashat and I'm also a registered nurse. I am with the Nebraska Infection Control Assessment Program called Nebraska ICAP. And I am a registered nurse and have specialized in infection prevention and control. So that is my background. It's been mostly acute care um, for 35 years. I am learning about school since 2021. I've worked with some fabulous people who've taught me a lot and learning how to apply my, my knowledge of infection prevention and control to the school setting um, and not just schools, but also um, I've been working with child care centers and early learning centers. All right, well, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um... All right, can everybody see that, the nice book? Okay, all right. Um, sorry if I'm looking over at this monitor and not the, the screen, but um, we are so excited today to share with you a brand new resource that just got posted on our website like late yesterday afternoon. So you as a group are going to be the first to hear about it. I haven't even sent out an email to school nurses or even the rest of the authors of this book yet to say that it's posted, but. Um, I'm so excited. We have been working really, really hard all fall to um, come up with an infectious disease guide for Nebraska. Um, this is something that Nebraska has never had before. Um, several other states, not quite every state, but several other states do, where we um, kind of look at what kind of diseases might be spread in schools, and we take a very close look at those, and then we match those with Nebraska state rules and regulations for schools to give you a really good up-to-date guidance of what you need to be doing if you have specific you know, diseases and, for example, how you need to be cleaning or taking care of a particular student. And then um, we also kind of expanded that, and we included our friends at Nebraska Extension who provided us some wonderful information on things common things you might see in school, like head lice or um, bed bugs and things like that. So um, we only started this project, which was actually came about because of an AAP, which is American Academy of Pediatrics grant opportunity um, for preventing infectious diseases at school. So we had this existing kind of team where um, several organizations worked together. So we just decided to partner up. So we have um, Children's Courts and Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services, DHHS, um, Nebraska ICAP, Nebraska um, Chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, which again kind of helped us with this grant to get this book going, and Nebraska Department of Education and Nebraska Extension. So um, it's a wonderful group that we got to tap into so many smart people that are in Nebraska and got to tap their brains, especially Dr. Alice Sato, who I really have to um, give a shout out to. She's our PEDS infectious disease doctor. Um, and so the kind of the intent, before I get into specifics, the, the intent of this, um, the intent of the grant was really to get um, information out to the rural schools. You know, there's a lot of rural towns that don't even have a doctor. They may or may not have a school nurse, but if they do, that might be the only health care that kids are really have readily, you know, access to. Um, and we know that, you know, health outcomes sometimes are as good in the rural areas. 
um, their vaccination rates aren't as good, and they, they don't have, you know, like the larger schools might have a doctor on the school board, they probably don't have that. You know, again, even if their town has a doctor, it's probably maybe not be somebody who is trained in pediatrics and probably is not a pediatric infectious disease doctor. But fortunately, we have a pediatric infectious disease doctor, and we have the wonderful people at ICAP, the doctors and nurses there, that specialize in infection control in different settings, including the school. So we wanted to just harness all the resources that we could with all these smart people in the state, put them in a book, and then give it out for free to anybody who wanted it and can benefit from it. So that is the nice book. And again, this is Dr. Shadda's idea for the name, and I love it so much you know, kind of a nod to the old uh, Nebraska NICE slogan, and it stands for Nebraskan Infection Control in Education. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. Oops, I'm sorry. So this, um, this page is just how the book is um, laid out. We have the section part one, prevention. So this is what we want to do to clean and to make sure, you know, we're doing everything that we can to provide an environment where kids thrive and germs do not. Um, and then we have outbreaks. So if your school does have a respiratory outbreak or gastrointestinal disease, something like that, you know where to go to for information. Then of course, immunization, a huge part of keeping kids healthy. And then chapter four is really dense, and that is the specific infectious disease guide for um, specific diseases. And also we threw the, the bugs and stuff in there too. Um, then bloodborne pathogens and the laws and, and um, procedures you're going to have to do to keep safe from those. And then the last part is resources. So um, parts one and two, Chris, um, she wrote a lot of these in parts one and two. Um, and then parts three and four, I helped write part three, and Dr. Shadow helped write part four. Um, so I'll be going over those, and then Chris will be talking about the bloodborne pathogens. And then I'll wrap it up and talk about resources. So without further ado, I'm going to um, switch it over to Chris, who's going to guide us through part one, prevention. Thank you. So prevention, um, of course, we want to keep kids in schools, in-person learning, and it can be done, but there's a lot of things that should be done to help prevent the spread of infections. So number one, hand hygiene. And I think schools really have a very good grasp on hand hygiene already. So we add pieces in it. We get the information from the CDC, but it uh, on the CDC, you'll see that it shows right off the bat, schools that promote hand hygiene reduce the number of illnesses in missed school days. So it, it's a big factor. Cleaning hands at key times with soap and water for at least 20 seconds using um, soap, water, or an alcohol-based hand sanitizer of at least 60%. They're all very important. Um, we want to let you know that hand sanitizers are also important. They are a um, preferred method of hand um hygiene in healthcare facilities because they really are less drying. So if you're going to be doing it a lot, you would think alcohol would be drying, but because it evaporates quickly, it actually is less drying than soap and water and it kills bacteria on the hand. So it's very effective. Um, of course, with small children, you have to be careful with it and it has to be placed where they don't have access, but it's still important that they do have access, especially in facilities that don't have enough hand hygiene sinks. Newer facilities may have that, but a lot of the older facilities, the only place is in the bathroom to go. Um, so it's not in the classrooms. It's not like at the doors when they come out for recess. Um, so again, you can use hand sanitizer, of course, if the hands are soiled, that would be soap and water. And then, of course, we'll go to that poster contest that Andrea put on. And do you want to talk to that one, Andrea? That's your new poster pack? Yes, I would be happy to. And again, this has not even been announced yet. So you were the first to, to know about this. Um, so back last fall, when we were planning for what was going to be in this new infectious disease guide, um, we thought, we knew that hand washing is like one of the most important things you can do to keep kids safe in school. Um, and so we thought, what, what better way to promote the message than with posters that Nebraska kids actually created. Um, we wanted to incorporate student voices, um, 
and we know that, that students can, can influence each other. So we held a poster contest and we asked people, uh, we kind of focused it on fourth and fifth graders um, to send us a poster that just was about washing your hands. Um, and we were aiming for like four really good ones to include in this manual, um, printed as part of the manual that would go out to all the rural schools in the state. Um, we had a wonderful problem in that we had 200 entries, which was, it was really heartbreaking to try to get those down to four. Um, and there were some we just absolutely could not print or could not part with. So we made up this brand new, again, this is only posted yesterday, um, hand washing poster pack. Um, if you go to the link in the chat, you'll find, um, on, on the, the um, webpage, you'll have both the nice book and the hand washing poster pack. But look through those, you'll find some great entries from kids all across Nebraska. And I do encourage you to use them. Um, I think there's like 37 posters there. So that's one for every month for the next three years. So you can switch them out. Um, and there's posters in English and Spanish too. We wanted to be inclusive and I wanted to make sure that um, Spanish speaking students would know to wash their hands as well. So we had some wonderful ELL kids that designed some great posters for us. And some of them are both English and Spanish, but they're really super cute. So um, you would not believe how creative these students are. So please take a look, super cute, cuteness overload. And um, again, I will hand it back to Chris and to talk about environment. Disinfection. Yeah, and you get to see a lot of those posters throughout the book, too, because we used it for the, the visuals. Wonderful work by those kids. So part of prevention, of course, is environmental cleaning and disinfection. We all know germs spread easily among young children in group settings, such as your schools. And schools have to be very diligent. Cleaning and disinfection processes are designed to protect children and staff in schools by keeping illnesses from spreading. And there is a science behind cleaning and disinfection. And you've, how, how do you choose the best product? It really does take a team. So I like to use an example because I've been some to um, early learning centers in a few schools and some of the things that I've seen, and it's been in more than one setting, is the use of bleach. Yeah, it's used frequently uh, as a sanitizer and a disinfectant. Um, <clears throat> so just to be aware, sanitizing and disinfection, they're not the same thing. Sanitizing, it reduces the number of pathogens on a surface where disinfection eliminates pathogens. So when you need to do one versus the other, it's important to know the difference. But uh, bleach in low concentrations, it's safe to use around children. Um, it's EPA certified, which is important. And it works both as a sanitizer, a disinfectant, and it's low cost. So it, it checks off a lot of those big marks. But there's a lot of stuff about bleach that um, can kind of backfire on you. There's a big difference in that concentration between sanitizing and disinfection. Um, they use uh, parts per million as the uh, measurement. So you use 500 for sanitizing, you use 5,000 for disinfecting, right? So at these facilities, there were recommendations in some child care books in some different places. They use 100, 200 parts per million for both sanitizing and disinfecting. And it doesn't come close to meeting that requirement. So um, a facility that had an outbreak of diarrhea, right? They're trying to disinfect with water. They basically, they were cleaning everything with water and that's what they've been doing for years. So it's just that people need to know um, and to have that education it's very complicated. It's not as simple as just going in and cleaning your house. Um, there's a science and there's a lot of training out there for it. Not for schools yet, um, but that is something uh, we would be working at and hopefully that this book can help with too. Okay. For the next slide, we talk about ventilation. Um, this is the airflow in schools. And we all know, you know, you've got your mask. Um, that people can wear. And that's just one layer of protection, right? And there's a lot more to it than just wearing a mask, how to wear it, wear it correctly. But there's other things you can do besides wearing a mask. And that is your airflow. And you don't have to be an engineer to, um, to do all these things, but just to have some basic knowledge to make sure your school buildings have adequate ventilation and air filtration is paramount 
to the health and well-being of students, educators, and their families. So reducing those indoor air pollutants, that's transmission of um, viral particles, but it's also pollution because uh, you're looking at it because of all the smoke in the air and the other thing. So when you can reduce that um, viral and bacterial pathogens in the air, you can ensure a healthy and safe environment, but you need to know how to do that, right? Um, there are significant health risk and can have infectious outbreaks um, in schools, especially with schools that have poor ventilation and filtration. You've got some old, we, Nebraska, we have some very old schools in old systems for HVAC systems. Um, that would be your furnace and your air conditioning. And so it's really important that um, the maintenance is taken care of and that they understand the terms that are used. How do you increase ventilation rates? You know that you could bring fresh air in to the facility as opposed to um, recirculating the same air in the facility. It changes if you're in an outbreak or you have increased respiratory illnesses in the community, you may want to do a few things that would help decrease that spread at the school. So we have quite a little bit of information from that. Okay, it, let's see. Of course, pets. Um, they, there are infection prevention considerations for pets and animals in school settings. Um, salmonella and E. coli can be spread by touching the animals in their habitat. There are rules and mandatory reporting requirements that go along with the ownership. So we make sure that that information is there and easy to find. Um, hopefully uh, you can learn what schools can do to promote oral health. Um, there's like a page or two on that. Oral health is essential to their general health and well-being. And cavities are largely preventable. They are uh, one of the most common chronic diseases throughout a lifespan. Untreated tooth decay can lead to acute pain and localized infections and in abscesses near the gum line that can spread into facial spaces, creating a regional cellulitis that can have serious life-threatening consequences consequences, excuse me. And as you can see, it kind of touches just a little bit of everything in a school. School staff, you want to keep them healthy too and safe in an environment to work, which can be challenging in crowded spaces. We all know that kids are little germ factories. So um, in this book, we provide multiple strategies for reducing the risk of disease transmission within the building and preventing staff illnesses, such as use of um, personal protective equipment, that's your mask and gloves, and staff safety considerations. And then uh, part four will cover a lot of that with bloodborne pathogen standards. And I think Andrea wanted to talk about this one. Or no? Oh, okay. Um, it, it, it doesn't matter either way. Um, so, so part two, we're just kind of looking at outbreaks um, and, and this is this can be a lot of different things, but we kind of had you know the big respiratory diseases in mind, so flu and, and COVID for respiratory, and then um, norovirus for gastrointestinal outbreaks, which we hope you never have. Um, and yeah, also as part of this, the, the next page is that we have some specific guidance for parents on um, what to do if your student has COVID nineteen. Um, and these are listed on the NDE webpage underneath both the book, um, like underneath a nice book, so we can pull them out um, so anybody can, can print them off and use them. Um, and what I just want to say was, was kind of a, um, both a challenge and an opportunity for this book is that, you know, the CDC doesn't have any handouts for parents on COVID in the school setting. So it was one of those odd things that were like, well, if it's not there, then we're going to have to create it. So um, thanks again to the the, the, lots of people that, that um, had input into this. So we do have those COVID guidelines available on the website in English and in Spanish. And then um, anything else, Chris, or else should I go on to the immunization nope, part? No, you can go right on. Okay. All right. So for this immunization part, I, I guess I, I'm not familiar enough, I'm sorry, with after-school programs to know if, they're, if they have like the same immunization requirements at schools or 
or not, but um, what this section has is just the, it states the regulations in Nebraska for children attending school, um, and then frequently asked questions as well. Um, and then this is also a, another section that's, that's pretty heavy with some parent handouts. We'll talk about the vaccines for children program, and then there's also um, lots of information, uh, links to information for parents on the COVID-19 vaccine through our old um, fruitful campaign, um, the CDC vaccine schedule information. Um, this, that's just one of those things I, I have to say that CDC vaccine schedule was a little bit complicated and confusing, but it kind of made a, a nicer parent version, which I haven't included. I think it's just so much more user friendly. So there's some links to that as well. And then we just have a sample letter that anybody can use. Um, and if you want it in a Word document, I can send that to you too. And just says, this is the vaccine requirements for Nebraska schools. And it's available in English and Spanish. Um, it's just one of those plug and play resources that we wanted to include for schools, um, just to make things a little bit easier. Um, and this, this section is just about the VSC, or Vaccines for Children program. You may or may not work with it or, or, or use it, but as people that work with children, I feel like all, all people that work with children need to be aware that there are resources for parents that don't have any insurance or their insurance doesn't cover a whole lot, so under or uninsured, um, so that they can get the required vaccinations. Um, so this, this is a, it, it's a nice um, CDC handout that's in the book in English and Spanish as well, just to kind of let you know. And then our graphic designer added the, the link um, at the bottom that goes to the Nebraska VSC page so people can know where they get their where they can um, go. So, and it's not just the, the urban areas. It's not like the big, you know, health centers or anything. There's a lot of rural towns that have just private providers that may be VSC providers. So, you know, hopefully people won't have to travel far because there's, I, I can't remember how many providers are across the state. If I had to guess, I would say maybe between 150 and 200, but that's just off the top of my head. Um, but anyway, there are resources for parents to get vaccines bottom line. We just wanted to pull that out and highlight that a little bit. Also, this is not part of the book, but just as a good public health person, I wanted to, to let you know that there's some health advisories that have gone out because respiratory diseases are on the rise, which you know because probably half the people you know of are sick right now. So we have COVID-19, RSV, and influenza all going around the communities. Um, fortunately, we have vaccines for these things, so we do encourage that. Um, the sad news is that there was a news release not very long ago that said that there's two pediatric influenza-related deaths so far this flu season, and we're not even, I'm not even sure if we've even peaked yet. This is not even the end of flu season. So that's tragic, and I can't remember the last time I've, I've heard that happening. So that was just a, a reminder to me, a wake-up call to me, to do what I can to spread the word that vaccines work. They can take the flu from wild to mild. This is actually the CDC flu campaign right now. Um, but they do help a lot and they can save lives. So please do that. Um, and this, this next recommendation comes from our Tips for a Healthy School Year. Um, and this, this is, is part of the book, but it's also online as a, its own separate resource too. I'm wondering if Kim, you'd wanna maybe put the link to that. It's, it's on the under resources for school nurses page two. Um, but this is just what we say. We have some you know, guidance for schools and some guidance specifically for individuals. Um, and students that work at school. So I'm pulling out some of our vaccine guidance and that's protect yourself and others by getting your flu and COVID-19 vaccines. Um, and vaccines.gov is where you can find these. Um, for students, you will wanna look at the vaccine schedule to make sure that they're on schedule. And that because you are professionals that work with kids, just be aware of the free immunization resources in your community through VFC or for other um, like local health departments will give um, for your low cost vaccines as well. And just to, to know that. Um, and for staff, you know, you see the current recommendations. We're really lucky that we have more organizations now than we did before. Um, staff over 60 can now get an RSV vaccine as well and some pneumococcal vaccines, which will protect you from pneumonia. So um, do what you can to break the cycle of transmission. So you're not going to get sick from students giving you germs and you're not going to give students germs as well. So that's just my brief little plug for immunizations. Um, and on the um, subject of staff safety, I'm going to go ahead and move to section four, which is management of infectious diseases and tests. Um, I realize I'm talking fast, but I only have four minutes, so I'm going to go ahead and talk fast. Um, so we have just a, a little bit of a chart for how to deal with um, children who are sick, but you don't really know what the disease is, just kind of general guidance. Um, and then we have the staff health and safety section on page 36. 
um, the tips for a healthy school year, uh, which is page 40 of the book and is also available online. And then we have um, disease specific pages and I'll show you that in a second and it has PPE and staff safety precautions. You are so important. What you do is so important. It was very important for us in the writing of this book to pull out specific ways to keep staff safe. So um, this is another kind of pull out that's it's in the book on page 89. We are going to make it into a fillable PDF. Unfortunately, we had some technical difficulties, so it's not posted yet because we wanted to make sure um, that you could actually post your school's logo. But this is what it will look like eventually. Um, and it's just some general guidance on when to keep your student home from school. Any organization in the school can use it and you can make it your own by customizing it. Again, customization isn't totally done yet. It will probably be done by the end of the week. Same link on the education um, website. And it is available in, well, it is in theory available in English and Spanish. It's not Spanish in the book yet, but again, it'll be posted in Spanish on our website probably by the end of tomorrow. Um, again, just some technical hiccups with the fillable PDF portion, but um, this, this should be good and this should be useful for like anybody just as a reminder of when to keep your, your students home. So um, the next part of this section is all disease specific pages. So here's just an example I pulled out and here is how we break it down. You know, chicken pox, varicella, what are the signs and symptoms? Um, how long is the incubation period? And I was actually surprised two to three weeks here. How does it spread? You want to know how to prevent the spread at school. Um, if you have a sick kid, how do you care for the student? And what I mentioned before under the category of staff safety is what PPE do you have to wear to you so you can keep safe um, around you sick students. Um, if you see an icon with a, the little red um, circle with a phone in it, that means that this is a reportable disease. Um, and that is something that you can call the health department to report, actually, um, and anybody can do that. And then, of course, we have it broken down to when to exclude and when to return. So this, we have this for lots of different diseases. It should be pretty simple. Um, yeah. And then on the next page, we, of course, have to have cool, gross photos. So these are some chicken pox photos. All the diseases that had, you know, skin manifestations or rashes or something, we really tried to pull out photos. Um, and we wanted to also display what it looked like on, on a variety of skin tones as well. That was important to be inclusive for that as well. Um, just in case you're wondering what these are, this is just chicken pox in the, the top two. The bottom picture, just really quick, is um, a breakthrough chicken pox in um, a girl that actually has been vaccinated. So breakthrough infections do happen occasionally, but clearly they're much milder than if you didn't have, um, if you weren't vaccinated. So. Um, that is how it's broken down. Um, unfortunately, if you want to just put out in the chat, like what diseases you kind of encounter at your after school program, that might be helpful for us. Um, this list is just all the diseases that are listed in here um, with lots of information for each disease. And just to pull out, these are the diseases that we have specific pull out information for parents. So we have it for PKI. English and Spanish, hand, foot, and mouth, same, MRSA, head lice, and then lots of, lots of information about head lice, bed bugs, and takes all of this in English and Spanish. Um, we do have some pull-out information for parents on COVID and influenza as well, but that's in a previous section in, in section two outbreaks. Um, so I see I'm at time, but go ahead and put in the chat if you have any specific diseases that you encounter a lot or any infer or any questions you have. I just have a couple more slides left. Um, and this goes to Chris now. Yeah, um, this section just describes what's for what's needed for schools to meet the standard and provides resources to assist with um, if you're developing an exposure control plan or you're reviewing, it just goes through the pieces that you would want to know about. You can go to the next slide. All right. And actually, this is becoming, we're almost at the end. Um, so in the resources section, I just have um, some information about educational service units and a map for that too. Um, and those, you know, very helpful for, for you if you are not in touch with them, that might be something that you want to do as an after school provider because they can provide lots of resources and answer lots of questions. Um, same thing with your local health department. There's a map there and that might be 
an, an organization that you may may not have worked with before, but might be something that you'd want to call up and say bye and, and you know introduce yourself and develop a relationship. Um, both ESUs and LHCs are wonderful for schools and anybody working with kids to partner with. And then the last page is Medicaid unwinding. Um, that means that if if your student is on Medicaid, then they might not have had to renew for like the last three years because that was put on pause during the pandemic, but now they do, um, which is fine, but sometimes they don't have their address up to date in the system or anything like that. So we are having some, some kids fall off Medicaid because of that. So if you just want to look at that Medicaid unwinding flyer, that's just something that I'm urging anybody, anybody that works with kids whatsoever to have on your radar. And you can, of course, um, ask me for any questions in that. Um, and that is all we have. So I, my questions for you are, what, what can we do to partner or to provide resources for to make your, your jobs easier as after school providers? And if you want to take yourself off mute or put something in the chat, that's fine too. All right, well, I'm gonna put my, um, I'm sorry, I did not put my email address on this last um, slide, but I'm gonna put it in the chat right now. And I can add and mine too. Um, you know, I'm here Monday through Friday as a consult. We are supported by a grant. Um, so if you have questions or concerns, that's what we're here for. And I have access to infectious disease physicians um, at Nebraska Medicine, University of Nebraska, some pediatricians to answer questions. So if I don't know the answer, I can usually find the expert between Andrea and I. We're usually pretty good at getting the information um, that a that you need. I'm also here. You know, that's what I do is I look and find those standards and regulations. If that's a question that you have, I will take the time and research it. And like I said, I learn a lot um, from the questions that are sent to me. Um, we're here to help the, to sit on the phone if they wanted to do a Zoom or in person to help them um, at their school. If there's a certain area, they just want us to come and look at to help manage. This is such a wealth of information and we just so appreciate you sharing it with us. We could have had you talk about your resource for hours. I'm sorry you only had 30 minutes, but if you don't mind, we're gonna invite you back down the road because I think this, this is so, so important for our after school program leaders and staff to have this, this information. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely, happy to have you. All right. To, to share. Again, this is the first time we've this is the first time we've ever like shared this publicly because again, this just got posted yesterday. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, it's a great resource and you did such a wonderful job of sharing about it. I'm I'm gonna definitely spend some time looking through it. The posters are adorable. If I were in a school, I print those and have them all over the place. All the information is gonna be really useful for us. Well, thank you ladies so much and thank you for joining. Um, we have our next Stay Connected on February 1st, and we will learn more about the Innovation Invitational that's coming up that Beyond School Bells is sponsoring. So we'll see you then. Thanks, Thanks everybody.